So this is a 22 year old. Um, I never really got the full story with this as you'll see in a minute. Um, but he was uh, running from a robbery scene where he had um, shot somebody, fortunately not lethally, and um, was accidentally or not accidentally hit by the police cruiser and then dragged for X, X feet. And it's mid morning, so they started early. And these are his other injuries, which are sort of jumping ahead a bit in a knee dislocation with no vascular injury, a relatively straightforward C3 distal femur on the opposite side, a grade one liver lack and a transient loss of consciousness, but his GCS was 14 in ED. And his injury film was this. And he's awake and talking in the emergency room. And that's our typical trauma x-ray, which was then repeated and then look like this. This happened about uh, three blocks from the ED and um, he did not have any kind of binder applied. At this point he's awake and talking but tachycardic and has borderline hypertension. I'm not going to spend a lot of time with the diagnosis here because I think this diagnoses are relatively straightforward. Um, This is the 3D of his injury. So he has a left-sided complete sacroiliac dislocation. And he has, in addition to pulling off the transverse process, knocked off the posterior part of the ala, ipsilateral, rami, and pubic body, contralateral, juxtatechal, transverse acetabular fracture, and then a transiliac injury which enters the anterior part of the sacral actually. And this is a single cut showing the uh, extent of the involvement, so essentially almost sparing the SI joint as far as articular involvement on the right side. And so we have this constellation of injuries, we're just delineated. And after resuscitation, this is where he stands. He remarkably was relatively easily resuscitated. He got three units of PAC cells, uh, and a hemoglobin of 10.1 or lactate of 3.2. At this point, he's hemodynamically stable. His head CT is negative, and they're going to manage his liver lack non operatively. And, and this is that rare case where it's mid to late afternoon and you're cleared for a short procedure. And, they, and short by them is less than two hours. So these are the considerations that I was uh, thinking about. Number one was just the duration of the procedure for stage one. And then these are the recurring themes we keep seeing over and over, and that is the impact of the pelvic ring interventions on the acetabular injury. So with that preamble and a two hour time window, what's our surgical plan as far as the prime first stage? We've got a magic two hour first stage here. Stover, anything you'd, you'd try and uh, pick off in that time frame? I think if anybody can't do something in two hours, it'd be Keith and then me, so. <laughs> I that their normal window would have been uh, four hours, but for me, they made it two, just so I could make it. Because <laughs> they knew you were going to make it four. But uh, I would certainly, if I have a short period of time to take care of this, I would probably uh, attempt a closed reduction and percutaneous fixation of left SI joint. I don't think that that will really have any implications on the transverse fracture on the other side because of the symphysial disruption in the front and the parasymphysial and the rami fractures. And then I would like to get the uh, posterior pelvic ring put together on the right 
but I don't think I could do that within the two hour span. So I would at least get the, uh, get the left SI joint taken care of. I don't want to approach the anterior pelvis because that will definitely set the uh, issues with the uh, acetabular fracture on the right. Uh, so my priorities would be left SI joint, right SI joint fracture dislocation, and then the transverse has to have a fracture, and then finally the anterior pelvic ring. If, uh, if, the, if the patient was fully cleared for definitive management, would you go prone with the bilateral open posterior pelvic ring and a, and a coker? Uh, yeah, I would definitely go prone. Uh, the question is whether or not I would try to do the SI joint still closed with some kind of pelvic stabilization device and pull that down uh, to the intact ilium on the contralateral side and the sac and the femur just to secure the patient with a pelvic stabilizer and try to do it closed. And then, because uh, Keith did mention he had some abrasions on his backside too, so I don't know what those the status of those are. But yes, I'd try to knock out the posterior pelvic ring with the first stage. Yeah, so he, he does have fairly extensive road rash, sort of from L2 all the way down to mid-buttock on both sides. But fortunately, associated with that, he does not appear to have a closed degloving injury, at least on exam. Um, and so those are the considerations. Anything else? And any of the other faculty uh, try something different? Would you try a closed reduction of the... SI fracture dislocation on the right side. All right, no takers there. So it looks like we're, uh, we're going maximally perhaps for the contralateral SI joint where the uh, presence of the symphysis dislocation and the rami fractures protect you from that having an effect on your transverse reduction. Okay, so um, the first, the first uh, hour was uh, spanning fixators for both knees and then I was able to pull through the fixator on this side. It only required about 15 pounds of force for, uh, for traction and flexion. The problem being that reading this is because of this floating portion of the AILA. Um, so we have preoperative verified that we have room for S1 and S2 screws. And screw number one, and then two drill bits for screw number two, and the end of stage one. So that's where we are after spanning fixators and uh, percutaneous screws on the left side. You have an AP pelvis following that stage? Actually, I don't. You won't. You're going to have to wait to see it in a bit. So it, it is. It is not perfect, as you'll see, but it's close. Any uh, any way of controlling the symphysis as well at this point? Probably not, right? Not. Well, I mean, in, in reality, um, on the left side, you have two connecting links. You got a pubic body and rami fractures and then you have a wide symphysial dislocation. So um, that does prove to be a problem going forward for sure. And so the question is then, this is a 22 year old, uh, great bone. Um, and I have frequently seen other types of fixation for this. I'd be interested to see what the panel thinks about what the need for so-called transiliac fixation as a second point of fixation in the situation. Bill, any- uh, so You also were planning for post-operative traction for the right side, Keith? Yeah, I'm, I'm, he's in traction through his frame on the right side. You yeah, I think, I think the question is the, the stability of the fixation, I think this, looks like stable fixation to me. I, I think that the S2 uh, screws generally don't have as good a purchase, so I might have attempted to put two in the S1 corridor, but 
I, I would feel comfortable with the stability of, of the fixation on the left side. I, I can't really judge the reduction quality, but just in terms of the question, is the screw fixation enough? I think the answer is yes. And I think it does also leave you uh, corridors for bone fixation because you know you're going to be dealing with the right SI joint fracture dislocation as well. So I like the fact that the screws are slightly short of the maximal length that you could use. I don't think it needs transiliac fixation. Thank you. Okay. So he, he for the reasons which were not entirely clear, he had kind of a difficult post-operative course, had a, a difficult time extubating him and was never really sure what was going on. So it took two days to be cleared for definitive surgery. And this is where I felt I was at that point. So the left SI was close, but not anatomic. And I didn't feel that I could improve it significantly with even with an open reduction. That the chances of an anatomic fit reduction of the transiliac disruption involving the SI joint in my hands is essentially zero. And if we put those two together, then reduction of the symphysis um, is essentially uh, not going to help in any significant way. And to me, the posture approach for the uh, transverse was largely taken away um, from my viewpoint, uh, on a soft tissue viewpoint, as well as the lack of a symphyseal hinge. So with those, now you can certainly quarrel with any or all of those, I'd be interested, but um, just uh, tell us where we're going to go from here. So Keith, your, your concern about the inability to get a perfect restoration of the, of the transiliac disruption in the face of a symphysis dislocation, does it, I mean, is it less critical there since it shouldn't affect your transverse? It will make the symphysis reduction, of course, imperfect though. But yeah, I mean, I think it, <clears throat> the goal here for the transverse is to restore an, a physiologic symphyseal hinge, which I'm not sure you can do surgically. Um, and therein lies one of the difficulties because I've already boxed myself in because I've convinced myself that I need an anterior approach for the transverse, which is not a axially oriented transverse, it's more oblique sagittal, which is already a problem. Um, and so the question is, how am I gonna manage the, the known deformities with, which we're gonna encounter with the, tra with the transverse component? Any thoughts? Okay, why don't you? Okay, we'll go ahead. So we started anterior iliominal, um, essentially with the intercalary fragment was um, very difficult to read completely. So I'm really reading this reduction at the sacroiliac joint with a very small area of articular surface to go by. So this plate is initially just a clamp. We have a shant screw here for rotational control. And then my initial plan was just to leave this semi-flexible and then get my best reduction possible of the transverse by controlling the synthesis. So I went ahead at this point. So um, we have uh, control of the pubic body on that side through with a vapor clamp, small vapor clamp. Uh, that's through the modified, if you will, third window and the asymmetric reduction aid through the first window and then assessing it through the first and second windows. And um, and unfortunately, I mean, we can see already what the problem is going to be because this interdigitation along the pelvic brim under direct visualization and palpation is virtually perfect. But we can see through here that there is this retroastabular gap. 
And my assumption was that by repositioning the clamp, um, that we would ultimately be able to manage this. However, as we know, this obliquity is not well set up for anterior to posterior fixation. So uh, I started with that. I thought that if we could lag in the anterior portion of this cuputic segment, so there's the obturator oblique, there's the iliac oblique, and this is the percutaneous anterior column screws that were put in. And then there was adjustment in the posterior column clamp. And then starting as far lateral as I could to anterior to posterior screws. And these were lag screws. I assumed that I, I had it captured anteriorly with the clamp and that I could use that as a way to close the retroastabular gap. As it turns out, that was a false assumption. I think, uh, I think we've all been there. I certainly have struggled with this problem more times than I care to remember. And I have yet to come up with a solution for it. So, so I thought about, I mean, I definitely could have put a small inf infrapectineal plate in here, but that doesn't really control it at this level. And so I, I was, you know, I was extremely frustrated at this point. I made a bad judgment call because I fixed the distal femur first. So we were already a number of hours into the case at this point. And, um, and my only thought was that the only anatomic components of this pelvic ring at this point are the sacrospinous and sacrotuberous ligaments. And so given the fact that the anometer bone was laterally rotated, even though I couldn't demonstrate it on my views, that I felt that perhaps I had a soft tissue hinge that was Latin, making it impossible for me to actually laterally rotate the posterior column. And I briefly considered uh, sectioning the ischial spine, but then I, I was afraid that I could do that uh, with relatively minimal risk, but I wouldn't be able to get to the uh, sacral uh, tuberous ligament, which was probably more important. So I didn't. Any thoughts on that? I, it's, it, it's certainly an interesting idea, but I, I think that, you know, it's, you, you won't know if it has any effect <laughs> yeah. until, you, until you've gone fairly far down that down that rabbit hole. Okay, because the only thing that I've done uh, on one occasion was in, in a case similar to the one that Phil showed last week, where it's a contralateral SI, you know, opposite of transverse, and the, SI, and the SI joint reduction looks good, but the symphysis still isn't where it belonged, as I have on one occasion at a desperation section to symphysis, so I had better control of the strategic segment. Okay, All right, we so that's, where, that's where we were. And we probably should have just stayed there, but I thought that we would do something anterior. I was fairly confident with the fixation, but I put a in, in situ symphysial plate on, which conceptually doesn't really offer much. And then we end up with that final construct intraoperatively. And these are his images um, at about three and a half weeks. He was in the hospital. He had a very stormy post-op course. It turns out that he transected one ureter. And so he had a, uh, a, an abdomen full of urine, got to end up with a secondary sub, uh, subhepatic abscess and got his belly explored and all kinds of other things. And I actually thought about going back and dealing with this posteriorly because I thought this fixation was flexible enough that I could do it, but uh, the opportunity never presented itself. Keith, now that that you have the synthesis fixed, though, do you think that's still an option? Yeah, I, th I, mean, I don't think this fixation would have, I mean, these are, this is a four to five millimeter gap 
hanging on this. And I think it probably would have been able to pull that around. I don't know. I, I don't have that experience in this construct. But the inlet actually shows the deformity the, the worst. So it's pretty well centered here, but you can see this component. This is, a, I think, three and a half weeks just before he went to the prison infirmatory. Um, and that was his final follow up because he was uh, never seen again. So I, I always want to know what I would have done differently. Um, and I think what I would have done differently on this, in this situation is I would have left the synthesis probably alone at this point. I would have fixed the anterior column, the anterior part of the pubic segment first. And I would have gone prone for the posterior part of the pubic segment. Because I think a lot more powerful reduction aids from, from a posterior approach. And I'd like to think at least that, that I would have been successful with that. So the question is that, uh, you know, if the posterior soft tissues were questionable early, I mean, how patient can you be to wait? I don't know. I mean, it, this is like when you're a, in the front. When you're this, in the front. Okay, go ahead. Well, I mean, I had the op. I, I mean, I could have operated up to three weeks. I mean, it was a classic sort of bicycle road rash. He had very superficial erosions. And I have operated through that before just by debriding the, the superficial eschars and then doing dual prep. So I think that would have been possible. Um, I think, Mike, your, your question is that, you know, after you wait a period of time and you get some callus around the rami or at the symphysis and your anterior column component of the transverse is starting to unite, like at, at what point is it too late to add a second approach uh, posteriorly? Is that your yeah, I, I mean, the one thing I would consider, though, is that if you're going to wait on the posterior soft tissues, is that maybe you'd have to stage the anterior part to clean it out again, and then do your posterior approach for the transverse and for the SI fracture dislocation. I think with the symphysis unfixed and the, and the rami unfixed, you probably have a longer window maybe then, uh, you know, then, then by stiffening the anterior ring with the symphyseal fixation. But I think that the, you know, the, the take home, or do you have the, yeah, right. Yeah. So, I mean, these, the, Phil hit all these points last week, but um, I mean, the symphyseal hinge for the ischopubic segment is critical. The problem is make, putting that in a space spatially, which is anatomic. And, uh, and then these issues. And then, I mean, I'm, it's really difficult to try to, to come up with general principles for concomitant you know, pelvis nastagra surgeries. But I mean, it's rare for us to get a contralateral hemipelvis posterior ring injury anatomic enough to put the symphysis back in an anatomic position. And so if we can't do that, then we're left with the necessity to exploit residual instability on the side that we're working with, with the acetabular fracture. And in this case, I didn't really have the symphyseal uh, disruption because um, I didn't, I had a symphyseal, symphyseal disruption, which theoretically should have made it easier. I, when I first looked at this, I figured I had a tremendous amount of slop in the system and so I, I naively, even despite the many years at this point that I already spent doing this, that the transverse was going to be relatively straightforward. Um, and in fact, I think the things that made it difficult were, again, just a, compo a compounding malreduction of the ipsilateral sacroiliac joint slash transiliac disruption. Um, and I'm, I'm still not sure, uh, and if I had to do it over again with pristine soft tissues, I would have fixed the transiliac disruption and then gone prone for the transverse because it was a relatively straightforward um, pattern for a prone approach. 